The markets make a rapid rise, hitting an all-time high as the feud over a new book about the president gets more intense, speeding up the publishing date. This is Special Report. Good evening. Welcome to Washington. I'm Brett Baer. Tensions may be high here in D.C., but the very public spat between the president and his former chief strategist over a new explosive book are certainly not hurting the markets, as the Dow has another record day on Wall Street, closing above the 25,000 mark for the first time ever, a full 37 percent higher since President Trump was elected. The S&P 500 was up 11 today. The Nasdaq grew 13. Again, both record highs. Fox Business Network's Deirdre Bolton joins us now with a look at what's driving these markets. Good evening, Deirdre. Good evening, Brett. Well, the best headline I saw today came from Drudge on Twitter, and it said, Bull beats Wolf. So a reference to the stock market's bulls or optimists outshining some of the upset caused by journalist Michael Wolf and his book, Fire and Fury. So excerpts of the book, they've been released. They have cast an unfavorable light on the Trump administration. But stock market investors, they shrugged all that turmoil off, and the Dow jumped past 25,000 for the first time ever, marked as well the fastest 1,000 point gain in the average's history. So, financial stocks, tech stocks, they were biggest parts of momentum. You can see Goldman, American Express, JP Morgan, Amazon owner of Google, Alphabet, and Apple. So the big question is whether or not these gains can continue. So market optimists, they say lower corporate taxes are going to help all of these companies, especially ones with lots of cash overseas. The tech giants in particular, they're going to be able to repatriate money at a one-time low rate of 15.5%. And then in the future, they're not going to pay taxes on revenue earned overseas. So these rules basically put U.S. corporations in line with most other industrialized nations, that is in terms of this overseas revenue treatment. Also, job market looks pretty strong. Another reason for optimism in the markets, we're going to get a new report out tomorrow. An economist that we surveyed say that payrolls probably grew last month 190,000 workers with even fewer layoffs than previous months. So a lot of reasons for optimism. Brett, back to you. Hard to believe. Deirdre, thank you. Mm -hmm. President Trump and his lawyers today demanded a stop to the publication of that new book that skewers the president and his administration. Late this afternoon, the book's author tweeted that the publisher has, in response, moved up the pub date, making that book available tomorrow, ending the tweet, quote, thank you, Mr. President. And the high-profile spat with the president's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, may now cost Bannon his current job. Two days of fallout from a book written by an author given access and interviews in the first days of the Trump administration. Correspondent Kevin Cork is following the latest developments and joins us from the North Lawn with the story. Good evening, Kevin. Hey there, Brent. A day after the president released a statement suggesting that Steve Bannon had lost his job, then lost his mind, today he was asked about his former chief strategist, and as you can well imagine, his response was predictably terse. Did Steve Bannon betray you, Mr. President? Thank you. For the first time since the book controversy erupted, President Trump today responded on camera to comments attributed to his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon. Any words about Steve Bannon? I don't know. He called me a great man last night, so, you know, he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. All right. Thank you all very much. Thank you. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. I don't talk to him. That's just a misnomer. Thank you. The president's ire raised by the forthcoming book, Fire and Fury in which Bannon and the book's author Michael Wolf make a number of claims, some of which were so objectionable that the president's lawyers sent a cease and desist letter to the book's publishers, calling on them to halt its release, saying the book contained false and baseless statements and gave rise to defamation by libel, including a claim that the president used to brag that getting a friend's wife into bed made life worth living. Bannon reportedly said the president's daughter Ivanka was as dumb as a brick and claimed the president and ate McDonald's because he fears being poisoned otherwise. Bannon also predicted that there would be a one in three chance the president would either be impeached, resign, or limp to the end of his term. Several people quoted in the book have already refuted its claims. 
Bannon was also hit with a cease and desist notice from the president's lawyers today, accusing him of repeated violations of the terms of his separation, including comments attributed to him in that forthcoming book. Despite the controversy, Bannon said he remained committed to the president's agenda. Don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart and the, the show and the website. The president, of United States, the president of the United States is a great man. You know I support him day in and day out. In an op-ed in The Hollywood Reporter, the book's author said he based his reporting on hundreds of interviews, including recordings to back them up. White House officials are admittedly weary of discussing the book. I'm not going to waste my time or the country's time going page by page uh, talking about a book that's complete fantasy and just full of tabloid gossip because it's sad, pathetic, and our administration and our focus is going to be on moving the country forward. Wolf's restricted but frequent access to the White House may have also helped to reinvigorate the implementation today of a policy barring the use of personal cell phones in the West Wing. Brett, as you alluded to at the top of the piece, the blowback continues against Mr. Bannon. There are multiple reports tonight that the Mercer family is distancing themselves from him. They are among his most important financial backers. This, as the Breitbart board is said to be considering Bannon's removal. Brett. Kevin Cork live on the North Lawn. Kevin, thank you. Much more on this with the panel. The Trump administration is moving to significantly expand offshore drilling from the Atlantic to Arctic in the largest single expansion of offshore drilling activity ever proposed. The five-year drilling plan would open up federal waters off the California coast for the first time in more than three decades and could also open new areas of oil and gas exploration from Georgia to Maine. The move is already drawing some criticism from both sides on Capitol Hill. Keeping the government funded could come down to one key issue and time is running out to try to solve it. Chief Congressional Correspondent Mike Emanuel has our report from the Hill. It could take care of a lot of problems. It would be really nice to do it in a bipartisan way. President Trump met with six Republican senators to discuss immigration, with the president making it clear he intends to keep his campaign promise. We need a physical border wall. We're going to have a wall. Remember that. We're going to have a wall. We need a clean dream act. But Democrats who desperately want to deal on DACA, the young people brought to this country illegally by their parents, say a physical barrier alone won't work. The bottom line is we believe there should be border security, real border security, and help for the dreamers. The president has given Congress until March 5th to come up with a legislative fix. Trying to force action on immigration, Democrats want to link the issue to ongoing budget talks with a January 19th deadline. This must be done now. Leader McConnell seems to think there's no urgency. We disagree strongly. Every morning they wake up with a pit of fear in their heart that they will be deported. Lindsay used to be a great enemy of mine. Now he's a great friend of mine. Really At the White House, Lindsey. South Carolina Senator Lindsey Graham <laughs> emphasized this president has a chance to do something big on immigration. Obama couldn't do it. Bush couldn't do it. I think you can do it. There's a deal to be had. If you want it bad enough, we'll get it. It'll be good for the country. Everybody's got to give a little bit. Some senators at today's meeting say they expect the next step to be a bipartisan meeting at the White House early next week, where they'll be looking to find agreement on border security and enforcement. Brett? Mike, news today on the health care front has Democrats really furious about Obamacare being undermined. What, what about that? Well, that's right. Republicans have long argued that being able to buy insurance across state lines would increase competition and lower prices. The Department of Labor is out with a proposed rule expected to impact about 11 million Americans mostly small businesses and self-employed. It would allow them to team up as part of associations to buy insurance together, presumably getting better prices. Critics note it would allow for selling stripped-down plans that don't have all the benefits of Obamacare, which also would presumably be cheaper. The public now has 60 days to comment on this proposal. Brett? Okay, we'll follow it. Mike, thank you. President Trump is calling for new voter ID laws just a day after dissolving his controversial commission on voter fraud. So why did that commission get shut down? 
Correspondent Peter Ducey joins us from the White House with more. Good evening, Peter. Good evening, Brett. The president just pulled the plug on a commission that had been led by Vice President Pence and was seeking to uncover voter fraud in the 2016 election, which President Trump insists helped Hillary Clinton win the popular vote. He now tweets this. Many mostly Democrat states refused to hand over data from the 2016 election to the Commission on Voter Fraud. They fought hard that the commission not see their records or methods because they know that many people are voting illegally. System is rigged, must go to voter ID. Of the eight states that said they wouldn't provide any data about voters to the commission, two had Democratic governors, six had Republican governors. A dozen other states said they'd cooperate, but with preconditions on the depth of the data they'd share. Some of the information the commission wanted from every voter in every state, social security number, party affiliation, and a list of every election a voter participated in all the way back to 2006. Democrats interpreted requests like that as attempts to intimidate, and the House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi is cheering this commission's demise with this, quote, the Election Integrity Commission's entire purpose was to encourage and enable voter suppression. The integrity of our elections has been undermined because of the disenfranchisement of American citizens, not the bigoted delusions of widespread voter fraud. I talked on the phone today with the commission's vice chair, Kansas Secretary of State Chris Kobach, who explained it's in the Homeland Security Department's hands now and that moving forward, quote, one of the most important parts of this investigation is checking to see how many aliens are on voter rolls in various states, and that's something only DHS can do. Kobach told me the state's least helpful to this voter fraud commission were California and Virginia. Brett. Peter Ducey in the White House briefing room. Peter, thanks. By the luck of the draw, literally, Republicans will keep power in Virginia's House of Delegates by a single seat. Incumbent Republican David Yancey will return to the House there after election officials drew his name out of a bowl to break the tie today. Challenger Democrat Shelley Simmons was there for today's drawing and remarked it was a sad conclusion, but also said her options, including a recount request, were still on the table. Candidate Donald Trump once said marijuana led legalization should be left up to the states. But today, President Trump's attorney general reversed a policy that helped the pot industry spread across the U.S. So what does this mean for states with legalized pot now? Correspondent Garrett Tenney joins us with that story. Good evening, Garrett. Well, Brad, Justice Department officials tell us that Attorney General Jeff Sessions is essentially unleashing federal prosecutors with this change to marijuana enforcement policy. Today, Sessions announced he was ending the Obama administration's approach to marijuana, marijuana enforcement, which allowed states to legalize the drug without fear of federal prosecution. Instead, Sessions, who is a longtime critic of legalized marijuana, will now allow federal prosecutors across the country to decide which marijuana laws to enforce. That policy change was met with some serious blowback up on Capitol Hill, though, including from some in his own party who argue the federal government is infringing on states' rights and that Sessions said he would not prioritize mar marijuana laws. I believe what happened today was a trampling of Colorado's rights, its voters, and that's why I will be putting today a hold on every single nomination from the Department of Justice until Attorney General Jeff Sessions lives up to the commitment that he made to me in my confirmation, in my pre-confirmation meeting with him. More than half of the country has already legalized medical marijuana, and this week, California became the eighth state to legalize it for recreational use. Some in the marijuana industry say, while the new Justice Department policy is creating a lot of uncertainty, at this point, it doesn't appear to be more than a symbolic move. If Sessions is simply giving U.S. attorneys the authority to go after marijuana companies if they want to and if they're violating uh, you know, certain provisions, then I don't think we're going to see an aggressive crackdown, uh, and it might be sporadic or in certain areas. And the U.S. attorney for the District of Colorado poured a bit of cold water on this new policy today as well and said in a statement it will not lead to any changes for his office's marijuana enforcement because his office has already been focused on prosecuting the greatest safety threats in their state. Brett. Garrett, thank you. More on this with the panel. The bomb cyclone is hitting the east. Can we just call it a really bad winter storm? 
whatever you want to call it, it's bringing blizzard conditions, intense winds, and even flooding in some areas. Senior correspondent Eric Sean reports from a particularly hard hit area of Boston. Boston has experienced more than its share of nor'easters, but the so-called cyclone bomb battered the Brahmins. More than one foot of snow, hurricane forced wind gusts at 70 miles per hour, plus a fast freeze sending frigid temperatures plummeting overnight are enough to challenge even the most hardy New Englander. They say if you don't like the weather in England, wait a second, it'll change. And, um, wow. I'm waiting and it's not changing. I don't think I've seen one since last I remember would be 1978, the last big blizzard we had. Major flooding swamped coastal areas, especially on Cape Cod. A downtown Boston street was turned into an ice flow. Thunder snow and lightning sent chunks of dangerous ice flying in the air. Major highways remain impassable. More than 4,000 flights have been canceled. While the blizzard conditions forced many businesses to close, more than 100,000 homeowners and counting lost power. The outages are expected to last for days. The rare snowfall also paralyzed a large swath of the south. The Palmetto Line streets of Charleston received more than five inches. It's pretty wild. I've never seen palm trees with snow on them before. <laughs> Underground pipes burst in Jackson, Mississippi. North Carolina Highway Patrol responded to more than 700 crashes. And sadly, the storm led to the loss of life in the region unaccustomed to unforgiving snow conditions. Two men died when a pickup truck overturned in a creek in Moore County. But it is the winds with the intensity of a hurricane that have shut down much of New England. Don't see what the storm looks like. Don't see what the flooding looks like because you're just going to become an obstacle. We're live in Copia Square in downtown Boston where it is stinging. Uh, Governor Charlie Baker just said that uh, the record for the uh, highest uh, tide is the highest ever in the state's history, and the National Guard has staged several rescues along the coast. And it will get much worse tonight, Brad, because of that uh, freeze. The temperatures will go down. Wind gusts in some places 40 degrees below zero, but relief is on the way. It should be 40 degrees above zero by next week. And for some, that could not come soon enough. Brett, back to you. I think your glasses are frosting there, Eric. Get inside. Uh, thanks, buddy. <laughs> 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 Next, uh, we're getting word from the Pentagon, by the way. 500 National Guard members called up to help with the bomb cyclone storm along the east coast of the United States, just coming in from our Pentagon team. Up next, another cautious step forward in easing tensions between the Koreas. First, here's what some of our Fox affiliates around the country are covering tonight. Fox 32 in Chicago, where a federal judge has ruled that the way the city's police department expanded its body camera program last year violated state labor law. The judge issued a recommendation this week for Chicago to comply with state law by working with the police union about safety and discipline disciplinary matters surrounding the body camera expansion. The ruling does not prevent officers from wearing the cameras already issued. Fox 40 in San Sacramento, where California lawmakers announced this week they will form a committee to create sexual harassment policies and look at how they investigate claims and protect employees who bring forward complaints. The committee will hold its first hearing later this month. And this is a live look at Seattle from Fox 13, our affiliate there. One of the big stories there tonight, the National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, says December's deadly Amtrak crash could have been prevented. The safety board said if a safety system known as a positive train control had been operational, it could have saved lives. Three people died, 70 were injured when the train crashed and went over an overpass while going nearly 80 miles an hour. That's tonight's live look outside the Beltway from Special Report. We'll be right back. New signs tonight of easing tensions between North and South Korea ahead of the Winter Games in Seoul next month. And President Trump says his strong stance and statements are the reason that's happening. Senior Foreign Affairs Correspondent Greg Palcott has the story. The U.S. is holding fire in the hot crisis involving North Korea by agreeing to delay joint U.S.-South Korean military exercises until after the Winter Olympics beginning next month in South Korea. It's a delay the South wanted. 
North Korea hates the drills. The U.S. have been reluctant to halt them. We've got to demonstrate to them that we are absolutely not interested in North Korea's regime change. Toning down the exercises will be a step in that direction. The agreement coming in a phone call between President Trump and South Korean President Moon. Following a proposal from Kim Jong-un to send North Korean athletes to the games, South Korea offered to hold talks along the DMZ. A hotline between the two sides was again used today. While there's no confirmation of a meeting, President Trump claimed credit in a new tweet. Does anybody really believe that talks and dialogue would be going on between North and South Korea right now if I wasn't firm, strong, and willing to commit our total might against the North? In Pyongyang, there was a well-orchestrated show of support for Kim Jong-un's message, overtures to South Korea, but tough talk against the U.S. The missile and nuclear arsenal, which Kim Jong-un promises to build up, is a threat to neighbor Japan as well. That country's leader promising to do his own fortifying. We will strengthen our defense capabilities, not only to secure the peaceful livelihood of our citizens, but a necessary means to protect them. Japanese Prime Minister Abe is proposing that North Korea drop its banned programs, a sentiment not exactly expressed in Kim Jong-un's message this week. Brett. Greg Palcott in London. Greg, thanks. The Trump administration condemned Iran today for cracking down on protests, and the U.S. Treasury Department announced new sanctions on five Iranian entities that Treasury officials say support Iran's ballistic missile program. Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin accuses the Iran regime of prioritizing its missile program over the economic well-being of its people. This, as the exiled Iranian crown prince told Fox News today, he hopes the protests now in his homeland are different from those in 2009. Let me be clear on what the message then was addressed to none other than President Obama himself. The chants on the streets in 2009 were Obama, Obama, Yaba Una, Yabama, which in Farsi means you're either with them or with us. It was directly addressed to the President of the United States, in other words, take a position. This is crucial. And it could be a, a, a historic moment in time where the face of the entire Middle East could change as a result, either for the better or for the worse. State Department officials say Iran's government has jailed more than 1,000 people and is killing those brave enough to protest in the streets. At least 21 protesters are believed to have been killed so far. The war in Afghanistan that began after the U.S. was attacked on September 11, 2001, goes on today. And in this new year, a stark reminder that U.S. troops stationed there are still very much in harm's way. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin reports from the Pentagon on America's longest war and where we go from here. As the Afghan war approaches its 17th year, the body of the latest service member killed in action returned home. Vice President Mike Pence was at Dover Air Force Base in Delaware to greet the remains of Sergeant First Class Mihail Golan, a 34-year-old Latvian immigrant from Fort Lee, New Jersey. Golan was killed on New Year's Day near the Pakistan border in an area not far from where the U.S. dropped the mother of all bombs last year. Eight years earlier, Sergeant Golan served on the same Pakistan border, shown here, manning a tube-launched, optically-tracked, wire-guided missile to track militants crossing the border from safe havens on the other side. Today, the State Department announced it was cutting more than $255 million in security aid to Pakistan, a punishment for its ongoing support for the Taliban. We consider them to be destabilizing the region and also targeting U.S. personnel. The United States will suspend that kind of security security assistance to Pakistan. Defense Secretary Jim Mattis was asked whether he worried Pakistan would close the vital supply lines and border crossing used by the U.S. military into Afghanistan. We have had no indication of anything like that. Since President Trump took office, the number of U.S. troops in Afghanistan has doubled to 16,000. The White House announced a new strategy for Afghanistan in August. We vowed to win this war on our terms, on this soil. The top U.S. commander said he now has more leeway to pursue the Taliban. We've used air power, dropped more munitions this year than any year since uh, 2012. The Taliban now control half of Afghanistan. Brett? 
Jennifer Griffin at the Pentagon. Jennifer, thank you. Up next, a constitutional showdown related to the Russia investigation. Avert it for now. After some last-minute negotiations, the Justice Department and the House Intelligence Committee reached a deal about turning over records and providing witnesses related to the Trump-Russia investigation. But the Justice Department is on a very short timeline to deliver. Chief Intelligence Correspondent Catherine Harris joins us with the still-developing story tonight. Good evening, Catherine. Well, thank you, Brett. The letter obtained by Fox News confirms that as part of the deal, House investigators will get access to all remaining documents without redactions by tomorrow. And eight key witnesses, part of former Director Comey's inner circle of advisors, will be interviewed this month. Those witnesses include demoted FBI agent Peter Strzok, who sent anti-Trump text messages, FBI lawyer Lisa Page, with whom Strzok was having an extramarital affair, as well as FBI general counsel James Baker, who was reassigned. And new to the list is the FBI's head of counterintelligence, Bill Presap, who Comey testified made the decision not to brief Congress about the Russia case during last year's election. Republican Chairman Devin Nunez writes the committee is extremely concerned by indications the top U.S. government officials investigating the Trump campaign relied on unverified information in the Democrat funded dossier. These witnesses are directly tied to allegations of political bias. And today, former Justice Department officials said the bureau hasn't been held to this level of scrutiny. The FBI in particular is not used to having its inner uh, discussions kind of brought to light and I think that's of huge concern for probably people uh, at the FBI. Meantime, a House Intelligence Committee Democrat accuses Republicans of limiting resources and without giving specifics the congressman alleges legal violations. Right. Do you believe that you heard evidence of crimes? committed by yes. members of this administration? Yes. Do you believe that your Republican colleagues understand those to have been crimes, potential crimes? I think some folks have decided to just bury their heads in the sand. The Nunez letter was sent to the Justice Department late today, and the Justice Department has confirmed that they have received the letter, but they had no additional comment, Brett. Catherine, some breaking news mm -hmm. uh, just in the past few minutes. We're hearing a federal judge has denied Fusion GPS's request to squash a congressional subpoena for bank records. Well, there's been this back and forth between the House Committee, TD Bank, and Fusion GPS, the firm behind the Trump dossier. Fusion GPS made the argument that they should be allowed to shield their contacts in the bank records, which included journalists, media organizations, contractors, and others. But the court has ruled against Fusion GPS, so those records will now be available to the House Committee. We'll follow it. Catherine, thanks. Earlier this week, we introduced you to Washington State's Attorney General who's made quite a name for himself by taking on the Trump administration. Well, tonight, he has a new target, but his latest lawsuit could be an uphill battle. Correspondent Dan Springer reports again from Seattle. Motel 6 may leave the light on for you, but now the hotel chain is accused of giving a green light to ICE agents who are looking to arrest illegal immigrants. Washington State's Attorney General Bob Ferguson filed a lawsuit alleging Motel 6 violated the privacy rights of thousands of guests over two years by providing immigration agents a host of personal information when they showed up in the lobbies of several hotels in the state. Motel 6 turned over their customers, their guests, room numbers, their names, guest identification numbers, their dates of birth, their license plate numbers, and their driver, driver's license numbers. Ferguson, who has sued the Trump administration 18 times, more than any other AG, is seeking a court injunction to stop the practice. But Motel 6, which cooperated with the investigation, issued a statement indicating that was done when these allegations were first made last fall in Phoenix. In September, Motel 6 issued a directive to every one of more than 1,400 locations, making it clear that they are prohibited from voluntarily providing daily guest lists to Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Motel 6 takes this matter very seriously seriously. It's noteworthy that all six of the hotels in question are in sanctuary cities. ICE has told the sanctuary jurisdictions that they intend to step up enforcement in jurisdictions where they have these sanctuary policies in place. ICE is not accused of any wrongdoing, but the implication is agents were on a fishing expedition, asking for guest lists and circling just the Hispanic surnames. ICE responded, quote, the agency's immigration enforcement actions are targeted and lead-driven, prioritizing individuals who pose a risk to our communities. At least six illegal immigrants were arrested in the Motel 6 enforcement. The lawsuit 
lawsuit seeks a $2,000 fine for each of the 9,151 alleged violations, which could add up to more than $18 million. Brett? Dan Springer in Seattle. Dan, thanks. Coming up, the battle over that book. Our panel weighs in on whether it's too late, too little too late, for the president to stop the presses, and what's next in this whole shindig. There is a new call today to literally stop the presses, and they are threatening to sue the publisher, Henry Holt and Company, if the book hits the shelves next week as planned. It's completely uh, tabloid gossip full of uh, false and fraudulent claims. Thank you very much. I don't know, he called me a great man last night, so, you know, he obviously changed his tune pretty quick. And I would say to Steve Bannon, if he's listening to your show, why don't you drop the nonsense, apologize to everybody. Don't worry, there will be no uh, daylight between the agenda, Donald Trump, and the uh, folks at Breitbart, and the, the show, and the website. It's been an amazing 48 hours. Uh, this one author, this one book, Michael Wolff, uh, is the author, and he had access to the Trump administration in the early days, as well as many interviews, which he says he taped. Uh, the book is Fire and Fury Inside the Trump White House. It was supposed to be coming out next week. Uh, Wolff tweeted today, here we go. You can buy it and read it tomorrow. Thank you, Mr. President. Rush Limbaugh weighing in on the publisher, moving the date up. That's the best promotion a book could get. You have your lawyers send the publisher a threatening letter. You better not publish that. that all that does is make everybody, whoa, what is in this sucker? They want to go out and read it before it's published. They get copies of it however they can. So that, that's the best promotion the book can have. Well, there are, there is obviously other news, but this has been the news in Washington, and that's why it's here in the panel. Let's bring in our panel: Tom Bevan, Real Clear Politics co-founder and publisher; Molly Hemingway, senior editor at the Federalist; and Charles Lane, opinion writer for the Washington Post. Okay, Tom, um, the cease and desist, and all of the coverage really that has come from the White House about this book has been quite something to watch. Very much, and Russ is exactly right. I mean, this is a publisher's dream to have that kind of publicity. Uh, I'm sure the book is going to be a bestseller instantaneously. Um, but the president's statement against Steve Bannon last night, Rebecca Mercer's statement against Steve Bannon today, have, has really been extraordinary. I mean, this Let's is explain a, that. Rebecca Mercer is part of the <clears throat> Mercer family. They supported him with money, billionaire. Minority uh, owner in Breitbart News, uh, have been a big backer of his for a long, long time. She issued a statement to The Washington Post earlier tonight saying she's cutting ties with him, not supporting, she's still supporting Breitbart News, not supporting any of Steve Bannon's other um, political initiatives, hasn't spoken to him in months. So uh, pretty remarkable fall for him uh, from where he was just a, a few months ago. But yeah, this is a this is a pretty amazing event. The amount of publicity and consternation, controversy that this book has generated in Washington uh, over the last 24, 48 hours. And obviously the White House, Molly, is pushing back hard, saying that uh, there are people who say the quotes are not accurate, that the descriptions are not accurate. Uh, Wolf is saying that he had a lot of access in the early days. Right. I mean, there are people who have said on the record that the quotes that are attributed to them are not accurate. There's Katie Walsh, uh, Tom Barak. He's also said things are sort of demonstrably untrue, like that Donald Trump didn't know who John Boehner was, even though John Boehner has been talked about by Donald Trump for many years. He said that policy wonk Stephen Miller, who's known for just being obsessed with immigration policy, doesn't know anything about immigration or it doesn't know anything about policy. So there are things that are sort of obviously not true. And there is that reputation that Michael Wolff has of spinning very colorful stories but also admitting that sometimes he makes them up. So everyone should take everything with a huge grain of salt. But there is some element of truth here, which is that the early days of the Trump administration were a pretty toxic environment with a lot of people fighting against each other. And I think that part does come out through the book. There are nuggets in here, though, that ring true from other reporting, Chuck. Uh, and there are some new things. For example, uh, Mark Carollo, who was a... Uh, press person, uh, was instructed not to speak to the press, indeed not even answer his phone. Later that week, Corallo, uh, seeing no good outcome, privately confiding that he believed a meeting on Air Force One, this is a meeting about that Trump Tower, uh, Donald Trump Jr. meeting, represented a likely obstruction of justice, and he quit. 
um, the Jared and Ivanka side would put it out that Carollo was fired. We haven't reached out to Carollo about that, but obviously the investigators on Capitol Hill and Mueller are going to be looking at some of these things in this book that they may not have talked about. Correct. I agree to some extent with Molly that you've got to take everything Michael Wolf says with a grain of salt because of his record. The one thing, though, that has not been denied, unless I missed it, were the things Steve Bannon has said, and that's why he's in so much trouble. And he's got a radio show in which he could have denied them. And what Steve Bannon said was that he thought that meeting was treasonous and a big problem. The Trump the, uh, Tower meeting with the Russian lawyer. The one lawyer. That we're talking about. <clears throat> and that, uh, I think, and this whole kerfuffle is the most significant thing of all going that, that has any real heft to it because it suggests, okay, Steve Bannon was in the middle of all that forming opinions about what might be going on. We should point out he was hired after the Trump Tower meeting, so he was not there. Tr um, true, but, but he knows but he knows the various people. And in other words, he just sort of he set himself up now to be questioned in the investigation and he gratuitously took off after the president's And they've already son. asked for him to testify up on the Hill. Right, so which is a natural thing. I also think it's funny that Steve Bannon likes to paint himself as this revolutionary who's taking on the media, and yet he managed to say the one thing that everybody in the media said about that meeting, and he just parroted that exact line. I think people now think that's a pretty stupid thing to say, one he'll have to talk about perhaps with investigators, but it's exactly the media line that, you know, a guy who he, claims he's against the media just managed to, be to parrot. ushering in people from the media with special access to the White House, like Michael Wolf. <laughs> <laughs> Which was the biggest real problem in the early days of that, for that approval to happen, for him to be kind of around the White House just talking to people, whether off the record or on the record, is quite something. Especially given Michael Wolf's reputation. We're not talking about a presidential scholar, right, coming in to chronicle the administration. Um, and in that sense, the Trump administration sort of got what they deserved to have this guy have that kind of access. Whoever authorized it, thought it was a good idea, thought it would end well for them, uh, was obviously sorely mistaken. All right, the one thing I just want to touch on, and this is now a narrative that we have talked about before, but it has picked up steam, especially with this book, because there are, there are numerous parts of the book where they describe uh, the president rambling. Uh, the Atlantic uh, has a, a piece out, is something neurologically wrong with Donald Trump? It's best not to diagnose the president from afar, which is why the federal government needs a system to evaluate him up close. And you heard this over the past uh, few days and at the briefing today. Is ill fit to be president of the United States. Next week when he goes uh, to his uh, physical, are there mental acuity tests that go along with that or is it purely physical in nature? We'll have a readout of that after the, that is completed. If he was unfit, he probably wouldn't be sitting there. I have seen him time and time again rely on the information that we've provided him to inform his decisions. So when you hear these stories or see these stories that he's losing it or that he's not with it, what do you think? It's absurd. I'll put it in Washington terms. It's demonstrably false. <laughs> <laughs> that was from the Reagan Forum. I was asking the CIA director, who obviously briefs the president almost every day. Look, the president is doing things that, by the standards of past presidents, are bizarre, like the tweet he put out about North Korea and the size of his button versus the size of Kim Jong-un's button. He is constantly embroiled in seemingly petty personal conflicts that revolve around what people said about him personally. There's no question that that kind of behavior is highly unusual for somebody in that office. So I guess it's natural that people would reflect on that and wonder about it, whether it could actually be medicalized, whether people from a distance who aren't medical experts should be trying to diagnose it is a very different question. But again, I think that is something that the president has brought on himself. I'm not sure if there's a clearer case of projection than people who lose their minds every time he tweets anything, speculating on whether he's stable or not. But this is a violation of uh, ethical guidelines on what should happen in terms of speculating about someone's psychiatric help. They actually call it the Goldwater rule because at that time people speculated that Goldwater wasn't mentally stable. You heard it about Ronald Reagan. You heard it about George W. Bush. Now you hear it about Donald Trump. And so there is a limit to what can be done. You cannot speculate on someone's mental health, particularly this is a guy who has acted this way since the 80s, at least as far as I know, uh, perhaps longer. My prediction is that you will hear many more stories about the 25th Amendment from a number of media outlets, and that's the effort to remove a president in office.
That's right. But let's just remember, as Molly said earlier, I mean, all of this stuff that's coming out in this book was during the first few months of the administration, right? This is pre-John Kelly, the pre-John Kelly era. And I think Trump did sort of end, end the year on a high note with the passage of his tax reform plan, his approval ratings back up into the 40s. And so, uh, obviously, I think that Trump's critics uh, and folks in the media who, who are against him will, will take this opportunity to take some of these anecdotes from the book and rehash the issue of whether he's mentally fit to be an office or not. All right, panel, next up, a little lightning round on legalized pot. Is it now up in smoke? We'll talk about what happened today. I think medical should happen, right? Don't we agree? I mean, I think so. And then I really believe you should leave it up to the states. It should be a state situation. The move that the Department of Justice has made, which my guess is what you're referencing, uh, simply gives prosecutors the tools to take on large-scale distributors and enforce federal law. The president's position hasn't changed, but he does strongly believe that we have to enforce federal law. Well, the attorney general, uh, you saw candidate Trump there, the attorney general for President Trump uh, issuing uh, this statement to all U.S. attorneys to prosecute federal law, including marijuana. Uh, we're back with our panel. 29 states plus D.C. have passed legalized medical marijuana. Eight of those states have passed legalized recreational marijuana, including adding California, Tom. Uh, now there's some questions about these businesses and what they may face. Right. And look. Federal law often comes into conflict with state laws. I and mean, we've seen this on the Defense of Marriage Act. We see it on illegal immigration and sanctuary cities, right? So, um, and there are two ways to deal with that. One is to pass a new federal law, if you want to change uh, the federal law, or two, it'll be litigated in the courts and the Supreme Court will make a decision. Where I think, but what Jeff Sessions said is right, which is one thing that you shouldn't do necessarily is just write some memoranda as president that telling your, your federal prosecutors to ignore federal law. I mean, there is prosecu prosecutorial discretion. That's what he's reinstating right now. It gives them the opportunity and the, and the discretion to prosecute some cases, take it on a case-by-case -case basis. Molly. I think both Sessions critics and Sessions are hyping what they did because that's exactly right. This just gives people prosecutorial discretion. It's not like Sessions came out today and said he's going to go after state regulations that permit uh, marijuana. But there is this conflict between federal law and state law, and it is up to Congress to change that if they think it's time to change that. I mean, you saw Senator Cory Gardner out here saying he's going to hold up nominations at the Justice Department. Why not just introduce legislation and get people to vote for it to remove some of these federal laws and let it be a state-by-state -state basis? Chuck, we just saw, uh, it was a lot, covered a lot on New Year's Eve, uh, a certain network at a pot uh, party. Is there this sense that it's being normalized across but, the country and that, I mean, where are the people who are opposed to it there aren't, uh, supposed there aren't, to go? There aren't that many. Well, I guess they can go to the states where it's illegal. There aren't that many of them. And there is bipartisan sentiment now that marijuana should be legalized. The majority of Republicans in the latest I'm polls should be I'm not sure that represent. it's across the board. Well, it, it, it is, at least in public opinion, it is now 64% favor legalization in, Ga in the Gallup poll. And it seems to me like we have a conflict now between a rapidly changing environment in public opinion, the federal law, and all these various state laws. One benefit of leaving it to the states is that it could be legal here and illegal there, and people could learn from different experiences. But, you know, as long as it's banned under federal law, they aren't going to be able to do banking, they aren't going to be able to move it across state lines, and there's going to be a whole lot of uncertainty that will prevent the industry from ever growing. I'm just saying there's a lot of people out there who don't think it's a good thing. Right. Jeff Sessions is one of them, and I think he's been, and, and that puts him, as you showed with the clip in conflict with uh, at least candidate Trump. But again, I, I, this is a more of a symbolic move, I think, than, than anything else. It sort of reasserts this, this prosecutorial discretion, which I think is a good thing for the Justice Department to have. Yeah, if people are calling it a crackdown, he's just said you don't, ha you don't have to prosecute, or you don't have to not prosecute. Not prosecute, yeah. <laughs> when we come back, proof that you're never too old to serve.
Finally, mm -hmm. tonight, a happy political story for a change. It's rare. World War II veteran Vito Perillo was fed up with the state of politics in his town of Tinton Falls, New Jersey, so he decided to run for mayor. The 93-year-old veteran wore out not one but two pairs of shoes going door to door, handing out flyers, shaking hands. Perillo didn't think he had a chance of winning, but this week, he was sworn in as mayor. All the duties, All the duties. Of, office of, the mayor, of office of the mayor, according to the best of my ability. According to the best of my ability. So how we got? So how we got. Congratulations. 93. The Bible he used there belonged to his wife, who passed away in 2013. Congratulations, Mayor. Thanks for inviting us into your home tonight. That's it for this special report. Fair, balanced, and still unafraid. The story hosted by Sandra Smith tonight starts right now.